Okay. Madam, do I start uh, directly? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, I am uh, CS Rajesh Tarpara, Council Member of ICSI. I welcome you all on behalf of entire council. I also welcome our dignitary today, today's speaker, uh, <coughs> CS Somani ji. I welcome to all of you. And I also welcome uh, uh, technical team and support team from ICSI on this webinar that is on SME listing. Friends, as we are aware that Exactly five weeks ago, we have started this initiative for a dedicated webinar on SME, SMEs and SME sectors. A little did we know that it is it has gained very good response and very heartwarming response was there. And uh, today is the last one of the series uh, uh, web uh, sessions today. Just as ourselves, not only the member are interested and keen to understand the MSME criteria and related aspects, but others others from the industry experts are also keen and are more in, showing interest to have this attendance in these uh, webinars. We have found solution to intricacies and challenges together and gained a newer insight into the same issues. All in one, the entire journey has been intellectually stimulating and satisfying. This webinar has uh, received very overwhelming response. So kudos to all the members of ICSI and speakers and all the team behind these uh, uh, webinars and marathon. Today, as we are standing, this, uh, this is a last and I am honored to host this webinar. I again welcome you this uh, on this webinar along with uh, um, an eminent speakers. Before beginning to the sessions, I would like to inform all the PCS member of ICSI that ICSI has opened a fifth ICSI Best Secretarial Audit Award and third ICSI Best PCS Firm Award. And the application is now open. So all I, I request is to please enroll yourself in this and grab, and, uh, grab this uh, great opportunity to have your, your audit report, secretarial audit report to be a best audit report and your PCS firm is the best PCS firm across the country. And ICSI will announce this award once the application is received. Mostly the ICSI is announcing this award while uh, in the CGA or Corporate Governance Awards. Along with that, the celebration will be taking place. So I request and I urge all of them, all the PCS fraternity to kindly take this benefit. Coming back to the sessions and topic, Today, the topic is SME listing and uh, integrities and, uh, and other insightful knowledge. Friends, as we are aware that the India is uh, driven by two kinds of the corporates. One mega corporates and another is SME sectors. We cannot ignore uh, the contribution and uh, growth shown by SME sectors in the development of the country. Almost 30 to 35 percent of the GDP contribution is coming from the SME sector, whether it is in organized sector or the, whether it is non-organized sector or it can be from corporate sector as a SME. And yes, NSC and BSC is also having that platform for S SME sectors. Presently, friends, in BSC, 450 companies are listed and same same way BSC is also competing to both the stock exchange and uh, around uh, 86,000 crores market cap are there in the BSE listed platform, SME platform sectors. And uh, presently the very, uh, we can say that there is huge uh, response for the SME IPOs. Every day we are finding some IC, SME IPOs are opening. So both the NSE platform or either it a BSE platform and people are getting more and more funds and uh, SMEs are also showing their foster growth and enhance their operation by utilizing this capital requirement through these platforms. And this will not only helpful to industrialists, but also as a professional to us. We are the professional to give the proper roadmap and proper web and pathway to them to have their list, uh, security listed on SME platform. We are there to fulfill the procedural criteria. We are there to fulfill all the requirement, whether it is fund-based requirement, listing requirement, post-issue uh, compliances, pre-issue compliances. And it, it is we, the professional, who make the easy process of all the compliances. With view of this, we are again here with SME listing topic. And uh, uh, today, let me introduce our fraternity, our members, uh, CS Nitin Somaniji, 
founder directors of uh, sunday capital advisory private limited a fellow member of icsi and registered valuer of ibbi he is also cfa from icfai cs nitin somani has very rich experience of two decades in various financial industries including merchant banking fundraising capital markets uh, corporates and financial restructuring merger and amalgamations valuation and he is very great speaker at various forum of icsi at icai uh, cwa and Ch- chamber of commerce and also he is uh, visiting the speaker as a dd gyan darshan in ch- news channel he is in depth knowledge of finance and uh, compliances sir we are fortunate to have your presence on this today's webinar and uh, the floor is open for you sir let's have a open and frank discussion on sme listing sir welcome you sir thank you rajesh ji thanks for the introduction and handing over the floor uh, a very good afternoon to all the esteemed members who have joined across uh, the country for this particular session uh, in this session we would be touching certain integrities related to sme the requirements of listing a uh, few of the points which are related to the listing process how as a professional we can guide the companies to go to the listing and uh, certain topics related to practical side of the listing the kind of application which can be come, which can come in into the issue and how to deal with such situations so with this i'll share my screen and take you through the presentation so first of all when we talk about any company uh, in the life of a company uh, there are certain fundraising options which need to be considered because company on a going basis required funding from various sources this kind of funding can be available with the company through certain modes which certain mode can be either the self funding if the promoters have deep pocket they can keep on infusing money in the company this will lead to the sustained growth of the organization then there was a new term which evolved around 10 years before which was crowd funding or the a funding wherein there are multiple investors who are sitting or hnis or ultra hnis who are sitting over there and they are looking for such investment opportunities so you can reach out to that crowd of hnis or ultra hnis who are frequent investors into such investment opportunities they will provide you adequate capital and with that uh, in uh, indication that how and what would be the exit road map and then you can avail the fundings then there are traditional investment channels of angel investments or vc funds or the pe funds which we say so these are predominantly governed by sebi and these are more a structured way of funding sources wherein you get into an agreement you uh, get the money which is being governed over by a regulator at the back end not completely governed because all these are private sources of funding but there are regulator uh, sebi as a regulator have issued certain regulation for governing such investment uh, platforms then the another term which came up around 10 12 years before was business incubators so these business incubators are somewhat providing you a platform or a place where you can sit you can uh, you need not invest into hardware you need not invest into software you will get some ground support in terms of your operational days when you are creating a platform or a business model so business incubator primarily take some equity take uh, in the, the return of the infrastructure support and the other light services which they are providing and one traditional source of funding is the bank loans which is available to corporate based on their business volumes and the business uh, projections now coming to this what is the growth phase of an sme or uh, a corporate in terms of fund raising the growth phase of a corporate is start from seed funding seed funding is primarily done by the promoters and a very close relatives and friends of promoters so to in today's age you must be seeing various startups which are coming up these startups are nothing but a common pool of uh, knowledge which get together they pool in their in individual funds and with these funds they start a idea or they start a company need not that be a tech company that can be a traditional age old company also of manufacturing uh, which is being pooled in uh, which is started with a pooled in capital of the known uh, uh, sources which forms either part of their relatives or the friend bucket list once you start a business with this kind of seed funding you reach to a level where you have demonstrated the performance of the business there is a proof of concept idea when the proof of concept idea comes then come the angel funding or which is also called as pre series a funding 
this funding is basically obtained for two reasons. One, the company requires funding which is not available through seed funding anymore. Second, the angel funding. They come uh, on your board or they come from the investor side as a mentor also. So during the period of this angel funding, they will keep guiding you through the process and take you to the next level. The third level is the VC funding, wherein you go for generally series A kind of capital. This is the actual capital for growth. You have sustained your business. You have taken your business to a particular level with the angel funding and the seed funding. Then you need the capital for the future growth. So this future growth capital is provided by VC or the, the next level of the same is P funding. P funding is generally a term associated with a more matured company which have already raised one or two rounds of capital. Once you conclude this level of capital raise, then you go for an IPO. This is the traditional life cycle of the fund raise for a corporate. However, where the SME comes in between? SME is a company which may go for an IPO after angel funding or VC funding because these are predominantly smaller in size and these companies need a better platform in terms of uh, capital market to take their business to the next level. They do not want to get into the loop related to VC funding or the PE funding, which comes with more stringent monitoring of fund by the investors and the decision-making capabilities. Now, when we talk about the fundraising options, you have two kind of markets available. One is the domestic market, another is the international market. In the domestic market, we generally go through an IPO or FPO. However, when you do an IPO, already the FDIs or F FPIs also invest into the company. So foreign funds also come into an IPO, but these are predominantly called the domestic market. Then there is a rights issue, which is available to a listed company. Then there can be a preferential allotment and there can be hybrid instruments in terms of convertible instruments, whether optionally or partially uh, or fully convertible. And there can also be warrants which can be issued uh, to the uh, allottees. There is also a concept note of uh, uh, your uh, warrants which are coming up with new different uh, dimensions. So with warrants, you can attach few terms with respect to the growth uh, of the company, how the company is growing, how these warrants will be converted. So these are predominantly called as convertible notes. So these are the new dimensions which have come into the option for equity raising. The other option which is available is international market, which comes through in form of equity, which is FDIs or ADR or GDR by a listed company. Or you can also go for FCCB, which is predominantly a debt borrowing. Uh, which has to be repaid. The FCCB comes with a minimum average and maturity tenure of three years. You can go for FCCB borrowings also. Now coming to the topic, what is SME or MSME as we generally say? If we go to the Act of uh, 2006, which talks about MSME definition, there are three uh, categories which, in which bucket this has been bifurcated. One is a micro enterprise. Second is a small enterprise, and the third is a medium enterprise. The micro enterprise, small and medium, these distinctions are based on two factors. One is the turnover, and second is the capital. So both these criteria, if fulfilled, then the company will fall into any one of the buckets. So for micro, the trigger limits have been uh, mentioned in the act as one crore of uh, uh, capital investment and five crore of turnover. Similarly, for small, these numbers are uh, 10 crore and 50 crore. And for medium, these numbers are 20 crore and 100 crore. That is 20 crore of capital and annual turnover not more than 100 crore. So these are the predominantly definition of micro, small and medium enterprises. However, when we come to the capital side, uh, market side of uh, the definition, these definitions are not relevant. So we should not confuse these definitions with the SME IQ, which can come on the stock exchange platform. Uh, the SME listing criteria are provided by the stock exchange, which are completely different from these kind of capital or turnover limits. Now, why do a company need an IPO? Uh, the company is working very fine. They are earning profits year on year. They are advertised positive. They are paying taxes to the government. So where is the need for going for an SME IPO? The SME IPO is required to raise long-term capital for the sustained growth of the company. Every promoter will have a limitation in terms of the money which is available in their pocket to invest into the business. The profit which is earned by the business will be reflowed into the business and that will be available for future growth. 
so for the geometric growth of the organization the promoter will have to depend on the outside capital that is why the sme ipo becomes important now sme they are the really the backbone of the country in terms of the business smes contribute around 30% of the country gdp the 45% of the manufactured output and 40% of the total exports undertaken by india as an economy smes have al also been able to generate more than 110 million jobs throughout the country uh, so this is a very large market and this market need to sustain for long term and to increase their capability and enhance their capability so that they really become the backbone of the indian economy and take the economy to the next level wherein we are talking about taking the indian economy from top 5 to top 3 in the next 5 7 years so this will really be a game changer in terms of sme contribution uh, contributing to this, this growth now going public would provide sme with equity fund financing opportunity to grow their business the growth can be organic also and can be inorganic we all understanding understand organic is you invest into your own business and take it to the next level inorganic growth is where you buy out a similar business opportunity available you merge with your business and then you expand your business capabilities so with the funds available from sme if you you can go for both kind of business opportunities and the growth that fund raising is difficult for sme because of their relatively smaller size of operation however in the last two years we have seen that there has been a tremendous interest into sme ipo the investors are favoring these ipos and they are willing to take calls on these kind of risky instruments also because these are long term and uh, better return providing opportunities so if you have a good business model if you have a good business to sustain for future and for long term and you are able to generate profitability then obviously the investors would be willing to put in money into your company and be a part of your growth now you have to create certain long term strategic objective for every company where you are going for an ipo they have to be uh, this sme ipo will lead to increased visibility and prestige for the company so today if i'm not wrong about the number we have around 13 lakh plus companies incorporated in india out of the 13 lakh plus company there are around in total 7 8 or 9000 companies which are listed on both the exchanges collectively including main board and the sme board now out of 13 lakh companies it is very difficult to identify one company which is providing a decent growth opportunity and where the investors can come and put in money but when you get listed you get the visibility in those 8000 or 9000 companies so out of the 13 lakh companies you come to a bucket of 9000 companies your results are declared and disclosed to the stock exchanges on routine intervals so the investors know how your company is performing and progressing and this will give more confidence to the investors listed company has to be more transparent in terms of operation and this transparency gives more strength to the investors confidence and the working operational efficiency of the companies also now liquidity for shareholders is a major challenge in private equity funding however when you go for an sme ipo the investor know that they will have an exit option available post listing of the company so the stringent terms uh, which are part and parcel of your shareholders agreement in case of uh, private equity investment these stringent terms are not applicable to the investors over here in sme and to the issuer also so the company can also perform independently and freely to take the business to the next level the investors are also not faced with the challenge of how to liquidate the investment because it is a listed entity now lastly uh, they this listed company it can provide an opportunity for the employees also to be uh, uh, kept and retained for longer terms in form of esop or espps opportunities company can come out with such kind of uh, employee stock incentive scheme which will make these employees part of the organization for long term uh, and uh, this long term tenure association of the employee will 100% lead to the growth of the company coming to the positives and negatives of an sme uh, of an sme ipo in terms of positive negatives i would say that every negative can be turned into positive how to identify the negatives the negative aspects are something either which are related to the cost or certain non monetary aspects which are more related to the risk which a issuer pro promoter may perceive in the company so let's deal with them uh, with them one by one the positives are you have easy access to the capital market 
So once you get lifted, your results are available, your performance is available in public domain. You can go and do a FPO, you can do a rights issue, you can do a pipe deal or preferential allotment. So these kind of transactions are permissible. Then you have flexibility in capital raising opportunities for business expansion because there are so many multiple options available. Then there is an independent valuation assessment of the company because the market where your valuation and your share price are governed by the market factors and the market parameters. So investors take the call on what should be the realistic valuation of your company. So this is an independent valuation assessment and it also leads to long-term wealth creation. We all have seen yet there are certain issues that have lifted on negative side also, which have given long-term negative returns after lifting. But there are a lot many success stories which are available in the market. So wealth creation is a part and parcel of a SME IPO. Then exit strategy for PE and VC investors and liquidity to shareholders is not a worry for the promoters or for the issuer company anymore. They, uh, the investors get an automatic exit into the market. Then there is an enhanced transparency into system and processes uh, run by the company. So you have to disclose your results, your shareholding pattern, the performance. There are certain material disclosures which have to be made as and when they happen so that investors are aware of the development with the company. This uh, disclosure by the company is also important because investors will actually lead to the value creation and the assessment of the fair value. So all these points are more or less interlinked at some uh, level uh, because one factor will obviously impact the other factor and similarly the entire chain will lead to the value creation. Now, enhanced ability to retain, attract, and reward the employees with various kind of stock incentive plans. Then there will be a brand visibility and enhanced customer recognition. Uh, you may also see there are certain tenders which may, uh, uh, particularly on the manufacturing segment, which may require a higher net worth base or a listed company being eligible to participate in the tender. So these kind of processes make the company eligible to go to the next level of their business. Then the cost of SME listing, it is very minimal compared to the main board, especially the compliance cost post listing. We will again deal with these kind of compliance costs in the later section of the presentation. Now coming to the negatives of an IPO. It is a very time consuming exercise. So it's not that one day you get up in the morning and say that, okay, I want my company to be listed and tomorrow the listing will happen. It needs a lot of meticulous planning and a lot of hard work to bring the company to a stage where you can come out with an IPO. Then there are disclosure of company information in public domain. So if you want not to give disclosure to the public, then please be remain unlisted. It cannot happen that you are lifted also, but you do not want to share the company specific information with the public shareholders. You have to make the disclosures. Then equity always is deemed to be a high cost of funding vis-a-vis -vis debt. Uh, then there is a loss of entrepreneurship control, influence, and power of business decision as a result of diversified investor base. Now, as I said, all these are risk. How you perceive and how you change the risk into your the rewards is up to the company. There is a loss of entrepreneurship control for the promoter. The promoter may dilute from 100% to say 70% after the IPO. But there will be a wider investor base. You have to appoint independent directors. You have need to have certain committees of the board which will take independent decision in certain functionings of the company. So all these taken together will lead to effective decision making. So a risk perceived by the entrepreneur ultimately converts into a reward for the entire company. Then there is a peer pressure on performance. So you are doing at a 100 crore turnover, you are growing with 10% growth. But is the competitor growing with 12% or 9% growth? Mm -hmm that peer pressure will always be there because company will be benchmarking you against your peer set. Then there is an increased cost of maintaining lifting and compliances with a with being an unlisted company. However, I would say the cost of compliances and the cost of lifting when outweighed with the benefits, it is very minuscule and uh, should not be considered with. So ultimately the crux is with advanced learning and long-term visibility, the negative can be converted into positive by identification of risk, growth strategies, and a streamlining of the corporate structure and the compliances. Once you are better governed, you will always have fair opportunities of growth, and the investors always like the companies which are better governed and which make full disclosure. So that creates a different stream for your investors. Now, coming to the next point, is your company ready for an IPO? 
basic three principles. You uh, know the goal, you plan for that, and you take an action for that. There is no separate mantra for this. So you have to evaluate your business plan. You have to check the growth opportunities available for the company and also the industry as a whole. So out of my practical experience recently, we did an IPO for dry fruit company. Now, if I say about dry fruit, the entire dry fruit business segment in India is unorganized. More or less 90% is unorganized. So here is the uh, relatively growth opportunity available. You come from an unorganized segment to an organized segment, you have the power to, uh, to be part or to contribute to the growth of the industry from 5,000 crore to 50,000 crore, completely turning into an organized business segment. So these kind of growth opportunities are available. Then you have to ensure as a professional or as a promoter of the company that best practices and business processes are implemented in your company. The disclosure and the compliant tools are adequately uh, taken care of. Then there should be a dependable and robust management and execution team. Uh, there should not be dependency on one or two person for the entire business. You should also work on business continuity plan or, uh, for the company in case one of the KMP or the senior executive is not available in future. What is the second line of execution and the team available? All these things have to be worked on. Then there would be financial reporting and budgeting tools. There has to be realignment of accounting policy and its standards. It might be possible generally we have come across companies which being unlisted may not be doing accounting for gratuity. However, when you come to or when you want to come to a listed domain, you have to undertake the accounting treatment for gratuity also. So you have to converge your accounting practices and policies in line with the accounting standards so that transparent and full disclosures are being maintained and the company is also in compliance. Then the investment rational and potential for future investors is to create wealth for long term. You should not look at equity market as a short-term mechanism for raising of funds. It is always and always been a long-term mechanism. You may have heard various stories of putting 10,000 rupees in Wipro, that value being at 300 or 400 crore or Infosys or similar kind of story. Recently, we have seen similar stories for uh, MRF also, the share price of which has crossed 1 lakh rupees. So these are various uh, proven stories in the market wherein the wealth creation has happened over last 20, 30, 40 years. So you should always look at the visibility of the long term. Then competitors and how they stand in the capital market, that also needs to be assessed with. Then there can be an opportunity as a professional to advise on the consolidation of business structures of the companies. So when you are elected for various multiple reasons, you may be operating business into more than one company, the same business into more than one company. However, when you go for an IPO, you have to consolidate everything to manage the conflict of interest among the promoter group. And this consolidation is also part and parcel of the pre-exercise related to the IPO. Then there can be also an opportunity to do promoter estate planning or the holding structure with the best tax taxation advantage available. Because estate planning or the holding structures is one thing where regulators are also viewing this seriously. And as a company, the long-term perspective or the passing of the wealth from one generation to another generation without the business split up is also one of the requirements for the companies to take to next level. When we talk about international market, be it Coke or Merrill Lynch or these kind of organizations, they have been running for quite hundreds of years. Uh, in India, if we talk about Tata Sons, they have been running for quite hundred of years. So these kind of legacies are created only we have, when you have a perfect capital a holding structure and the promoter estate planning is put in place so that there are no uh, uh, issues related to control diversion in future. Now coming to the key requirements of listing. Uh, the chapter 9 of SEBI ICDR regulations, this is the short form what we call uh, in full form, we say company, uh, SEBI issue of capital and disclosure requirement regulation. Uh, these regulations have again been amended from time to time. In 99, there used to be a SEBI dip guidelines, which was over, uh, modified and then uh, from time to time. Then in 2009, SEBI ICDR regulations were introduced for the uh, first time. So the uh, governing regulation, they moved from guidelines to regulation, making regulator more powerful in terms of making the disclosures. 
After that, these ICDR regulations have again been amended from time to time, but in 2021 with the, uh, 2018, with the need felt, these regulations were again modified. And today we have set the ICDR regulation 2021, which governs with capital markets. Chapter nine of that specific regulation deals with SME issues. So into SME issue, one of the core advantages that you require approval only from stock exchanges. SEBI approval is not required. Then you have to select any one of the SME platform of for listing. Dual listing is not allowed. When I say dual listing is not allowed, it means that you can get listed either only on NSC platform or BSC platform. Like a main board IPO, you cannot select both the exchanges for listing. Then your post tissue face value should not be uh, exceed 25 crores. Your minimum application size under the IPO should not be less than 1 lakh rupees per application. This was the basic rationale uh, so that the retail investors actually do not come into the SME IPO. So we wanted that uh, the investors who are coming in this IPO should have certain capabilities in terms of assessment of the company and also to take the risk related to such kind of a small businesses. A retail investor in a main board IPO can invest uh, with a value of 10 to 15,000 rupees. But in, when we talk about an SME IPO, this is the minimum one lakh application size. Then the number of prospective allottees under the IPO should not be less than 50. The 100% of the issue should be underwritten. Uh, in terms of underwriting, we generally say it hard underwriting that if the issue do not get succeeded, the liability will devolve on the underwriters. The merchant banker who is handling the issue is required to take a minimum 15% underwriting for the entire issue size. Then market making is for minimum three year period. Then there is a mandatory facilitation of trading in DMAT securities. So the companies have to get their securities admitted with NHGL and CDSL both. There is a requirement of firm financial arrangement of 75% of fund required. We will again take this in a later section of the presentation. Uh, the general corporate purpose cannot exceed 25%. General corporate purpose means a purpose not identified per se, but the company can use it for any other business requirement. So broader counters of general corporate purpose have to be defined, for example, marketing or acquisition or working capital. But uh, it cannot be completely vague, but there is no identified purpose for which you can allocate a maximum of 25%. Thereafter, the company should have an operational website. This website should also have an investor section wherein uh, disclosures are, have to be made with respect to investors and the requirements as provided under SEBI LODR regulations. Then SME, uh, as an SME platform, a stock exchange charge a very lower fees, uh, which is the initial and the annual listing fees compared to the main board IPO. Now, how do you take your company from the past or the present to the future? You have to get this company ready for the future. So this is not just doing an IPO. There is a lot of work, which I say, as I said, is required before, even before an IPO. So to make an IPO successful and to get a company listed, there are four steps which you have to follow. You have to assess, you have to plan, you have to execute, and after listing, you have to sustain. So these four steps, if adequately followed, you can have a success story of your client too to get listed on an SME platform. Now, how to get a company ready? So there has to be a complete review of the business. The business of the company and its unique selling proposition why the company stands out differently from its competitor or what are the growth triggers. Then value chain assessment and future growth potential have to be identified. Position of the company in its peer group and comparative financial performance has to be checked. Whether the value which the promoters of your client are expecting, is it fair in terms of the other similar listed entities in the market or not? So this can be done through a comparative financial performance. Infrastructure, which is available with the company in terms of office, manufacturing plant, information technology, business reporting systems, asset, plant and machinery, and whatnot. Then development of internal controls with soundness in reporting and methodologies and solidify accounting controls. Because once you go to a public domain, you cannot afford any kind of frauds or lapses in the processes. So everything has to be impeccable and should be backed up or governed in a proper manner so that there are negligible frauds or defaults in future. 
for example, if you are creating a metric for compliance, there is a due date for compliance. So for example, on 13th, you have to file a GSTR one. So how the trigger starts in the system, the person who has to report uh, or who has to do this filing, he will be intimated from day one. Then after day seven or eight or nine, then there would be escalation of the same thing if the return had not been filed. The escalation will be to the managerial level. If the return is not filed as well, then the escalation should go to the management or the board of directors that the return has not been filed. So these are few controls and the system processes which have to be created so that there are no chances of any default or non-compliance in future. The alignment of the books of account with the accounting policies have to be done. Uh, the revenue projections have to be created and it has to be monitored. The future performance has to be monitored with the target set. This is very critical in terms of achieving your objectives. Building a strong internal and external advisors team to guide you through the process. So internal advisor team obviously con it's a concept of CS, CFO or the legal heads or the business and operations head. The external advisor team comprises of the practicing CS or the chartered accountants or lawyers who guide the company on related matters. So it is always a combination of both the teams which lead to the success. Then identifying the best team for managing the IPO. This is equally critical for undertaking the IPO. Now, how we get ready? So these are certain summarizations in the points. One, you have to create a vision for the organization. The vision need, should not be for two years or three years horizon. The vision should be always be a long term. When you start a business, you always come with a vision and mission policy or a statement. So why you want to do that business, why you are entering into this business and what you want or where you want to take that business after five years or 10 years. So that vision should be very clear. Once you have decided on the vision of the organization, then you have to identify the key strategies and create a roadmap to achieve that vision. This strategy can be in terms of uh, how you implement your business, how you run your business, how you uh, take your team forward, how you treat your suppliers, everything matters. So these identification of strategies and roadmap is equally important. Then there is an estimation of future projections and assessment of financial projections. So estimation of future projections, your company would have been growing on 5% or 7% growth rate in the past five years. But whether the company will grow at the same rate and how it will grow on the same rate or a better rate. So once the SME IPO funds comes with the company after a successful IPO, these funds will lead to the growth of the organization. So how that 5% or 7% growth can be translated into 10, 15 or 20% growth, that roadmap has to be created with the projections and the assumptions. Once you create this, so SME IPO, as I said, it is not that someday you got up in the morning and you do an IPO. There's a proper planning and the time required. So that time period can be six months, one year or two year time period, depending on the company and the business. Once you reach to that level, so if you have created a projection, say on 1st January 2022, so assessment in 23 to March, assessment in 22 September, assessment in March 23 and September 23 is equally important. This will help you to uh, understand that where you have failed in terms of achieving your projection and how you are uh, coming up or shaping up your organization for future roadmap. This is where really where the investors would be interested in to understand. Now, time is the essence for coming out with an IPO. Uh, you cannot always say, okay, I'll bring IPO after three years or four years. You have to clearly identify a roadmap with the timeline that in these timelines, you have to achieve these numbers, achieve these projections and come out with the IPO at so-and-so assumed valuation, depending on the future valuation the market will give. So time is very critical in this entire process. Now, there will be fill in the gaps in organization structure and compliance to meet listing norms. Uh, there may be certain requirements which are there to meet the compliances of uh, listed companies. So you may be required to converge your financials to in there, not right now when you go for an IPO, but for future, you have to create a roadmap for that. 
you have to ensure that there are independent directors appointed you have to ensure that there are women director appointed that you have a co corporate governance committee you meet with other compliances related to corporate governance so these are few things which can be fulfilled in then you need a cs you need a cfo if not uh, really appointed till the date you decide for an ipo so these are the gaps in organization structure which have to be fulfilled then compliances again it might be possible that you are not meeting with certain compliances in the past but everything has to be rectified if required a compounding application has to be filed otherwise you directly go ahead and do the lifting we have seen certain cases in the past where either the companies have not followed section 42 requirement for preferential allotment there are companies wherein they may have done allotment to more than 50 people under the earlier act or 200 people in one financial year and that's the non compliance for maximum number of allottees then there can be certain appointments gaps in terms of independent directors all these things have to be rectified plus more important is that you file a compounding application for such non compliances so that the future risk and liabilities of the investors and the shareholder get reduced for example if today you do not file a compounding application in future the liability will fall onto all shareholders of the company including the public segment which a public investor will never like to take forward and as a role of the professionals whether in capacity of a company secretary certifying documents related to ipo or as a lawyer who is acting as a legal counsel or we as a merchant banker who work for an ipo so we all carry the owner to ensure that these kind of disclosures are made in the offer document. You, at the SEBI, you have to come out with every risk associated with the organization. And these risks have to be informed to the shareholders before the company raises money. So it becomes very important to reduce the life, future liability which may come up on the company because of these non-compliances. Then last but not the least, there is a fair value assessment which is required. But yes, this value should be such that the investors feel interested in uh, investing into your IPO so that it creates a well balance between the value and the price which you're offering and which the investor wants. So that will create a win-win situation for all the participants in the IPO. Now, how do you plan for an IPO? Uh, it's not necessary that a merchant banker will come and do everything. There's a lot of exercise which can be started a year before the IPO process. Uh, you have to get engaged with your client, understand the visibility and the uh, requirement which they are looking after six months, one year, one and a half year down the line. We generally perceive that there is a time period required for around six to 12 months on the minimum side to make any company ready for an IPO. Uh, when you want to make your client ready for an IPO, you have to start around 8 to 12 months before IPO. You have to understand the rationale for going to public. Going to public does not mean that just you need the funds. You need to come out with a clear cut objective for that fund utilization also. Then meeting with the management, KMP, and internal team of the advisor, advisor, internal team of advisors, setting up for business plans and whether the company has reached the targets or not. Improvisation of internal control, reporting practice, and business information systems, compliance with applicable laws and obtaining registrations. If any registration has not been obtained with, there may be a discrepancy in terms of fire approval or NOC for the DG set or something available at the factory premises. So, or as small as a shops and establishment uh, registration for a small location branch office of the company. So, all these compliances have to be met with. Then what are the alternative options available to the company in terms of fundraise? What are the timelines and the costs involved for that? Because getting money at the right time is most important for the client. It's not necessary that money can come only through an IPO. So you have to assess these requirements of the clients also in terms of timelines and when they need the money. Then developing processes from listing perspective. Because post listing, you have to disclose your results within a specified time frame. You have to file your uh, shielding pattern within a specified time frame. So all these compliances have to meet a deadline. So accordingly, you have to create your processor also so that at the time of listing or after listing, you are able to comply with such requirements. Then there may be a requirement of corporate and capital restructuring. Your client may be doing a 100 crore business, but at a paid up capital of 50 lakh. So you cannot come out with an IPO with 50 lakh of capital. You need to restructure that capital either with a bonus of some fresh allotment or rights issue. So all those capital structuring exercises also need to be done. 
we have already discussed the requirement of restructuring of the entire group in terms of to avoid conflict of interest and bringing the synergies of operation into one single umbrella or one single entity so that you maximize the valuation for the shareholders. Then consideration of ownership issues, succession planning and taxation. Now, once we are passed through this step, we are more closer to the IPO. So we have to work on other aspects related to consolidation of all financial information related to the company. You have to create a data room and preferably a virtual data room for the purpose of due diligence. You have to conduct the internal due diligence so that the company comes out clean and better governed in terms when the external party comes and do the due diligence. Then preparation of the draft of a document can be started. You need to broadcast the board and committee, the appointment of KMP, assessment of peer set and competition, the brand building exercise, visibility creation, all those things have to be started. Then you also need to work with restated financial statements. Restated financial statements uh, is something wherein you consolidate or bring three year financial statements in the same comparative table. In, when you do this, it might be possible in one year you have charged depreciation on WDB method, in other year you have charged depreciation on SLM. So these are not comparable financials. So when you do a restatement or when the auditor do the restatement, the financial statements have to be bought at par with the current accounting policies adopted and followed by the company. So today if the company is calculating depreciation on SLM basis, so previous year where it was charged on the uh, WDB method, those have to be recalculated and the impact has to be assessed. Similar for gratuity or prior period items or similar kind of items which need adjustment, they all get adjusted under restated financial statement. Then you, as a professional, you have to get your client introduced intermediate for the IPO and also need to work on the dematerialization of shares. Then more near to the IPO, you have to start working on the due diligence, appointment of the intermediaries, predominantly the merchant bankers and the lawyers. Then you have, can also help the company doing the pre-IPO in meetings with the institutional investors or HNI or ultra HNI investors if you have a base available. This will help you to strengthen your relationship with the prospective IPO client. Then the initial roadshow can be started, brand building and creating visibility is a process which has to continue till the IPO. Then more frequent internal meetings have to be held in the organization in terms of uh, the compliance and monitoring the roadmap to the IPO. Then when you get more close to the IPO, then the final documentation is being created. The offer document is filed with the stock exchanges. The approvals are sought from the stock exchanges. Then finalization of the offer document in compliance with the comment received from uh, Chalk Exchange. Then there will be a roadshow, press meet and broker meet, meeting with the investors and analysts, then newspaper advertisement, marketing of the issue with institution, brokers and public, registration of the offer document and deciding on the issue schedule and offer pricing. So this part is predominantly taken care by the market intermediary, but yes, as a backbone and as the advisor to the client. You can always help the client in various modes. We will also come uh, slightly touch these sections in the future part of the presentation, wherein how you can get associated with the client during this period also is taken care of. Now, what are the advantages for listing? Uh, the advantages of SME listing comes in form of uh, three categories. One is the advantages which the company get. Second is the regulatory advantages. And third is uh, basically other advantages. Under company advantages, fund availability from the investors. Uh, this is one major uh, challenge which is being overcome through an SME IPO. Then you go to create better leveraging capabilities. If through an IPO you raise 30, 40, 50 crores, you make your net worth better. If your net worth is better, in terms of the net worth, your debt equity ratio will always fall and you have the capability to raise additional debt to uh, basically leverage on the future growth. So this is another advantage. Visibility in creating track record with the customers, suppliers, institutions, media, investors, this is an inherent advantage which you get. And better liquidity entry and exit platform for the investors. In terms of regulatory advantage, 
the investors will get a concessional rate of 10% on long-term capital gains and a lower tax rate of 15% on short-term capital gains. However, this will be applicable only when the investor has paid HTT at the time of sale of shares or purchase of shares. So this other concessional rate, if we talk about unlisted company, the short-term capital gain would be 30% or long-term would be 20%. So these are the certain advantages which come. In terms of second advantages, uh, the justification of excess premium received on allotment. This is a major challenge for any organization. When a company makes an allotment, they have to justify that the premium which has been charged on the issuance of equity shares or convertible instrument is justified and fair in terms of the valuation undertaken under Section 5627B of the Income Tax Act. However, when you get lifted, this section is not applicable on you. Uh, coming to disclosure norms, compared with the main board IPO, you have a half yearly requirement. You don't have to give quarterly requirement. And the disclosure norms are pretty simplified in terms of uh, comparative analysis with the main board listed companies. The other advantages which comes are enhancing worth for all stakeholders, be it promoters or be it the IPO or post IPO stakeholders. Then ESOPs with marketable security becomes one of the greater tool for employee retention. And setting up of internal risk management and governance system, which strengthens the future control system policy for the organization. So how this long term will work? You have to follow the three rules. One, mission. Second, target. Third, achieve. Once you achieve your mission, you again go back to the same slide and you follow the same principle. So if you are lifted, you follow the principle the sky is the limit and your company will keep on growing and create value for the investors. Now, what are the eligibility criteria for SME IPO? In India, we have two exchanges which are providing a platform for SME listing. One is NSC, second is BSC. NSC has around 340 or 342 companies listed on their platform, which is called as NSC Emerge. BSC SME platform is called as BSC SME, and there are around 450 companies which have got listed on BSC SME. Uh, the number does not say the story. BSC may have higher number, NSC may have a smaller number, but each exchange operates separately. They have their own due diligence criteria, internal criteria for assessment of any company, uh, and exchanges give their independent approvals. So it's not that uh, BSC may be more flexible in giving the approvals, NSC is not flexible, or these kind of situations do not arise. Both exchanges predominantly fall under the SEBI purview and they follow the SEBI guidelines. It's more the relevant choice of the issuer that which, with which exchange they want to go. Now, these uh, parameters or the listing criteria are broadly categorized into around uh, 10 points. One is the track record. Uh, the company, uh, so again, uh, I will be first going with NSC and then BSC. So the company should be have operating profits, which is earning before interest depreciation and tax for at least two financial years out of three preceding years. Uh, then there should also be a track record of at least three years for the applicant or for the promoters or promoting company or for the proprietor or partnership firm which has been converted and then the company approaches for listing. For BSC, there is a requirement of positive cash accrual that is earning before depreciation and tax in any one out of three years. So for NSC, it is two out of three years and that should be positive operating profit. BSC talks about positive cash accruals in one out of three years. Then they also have a requirement of track record of three years for the company or the promoters, which is coming up for listing. Uh, then both in both the cases, the company should be a company incorporated in India. A LLP or a partnership or any other form of organization cannot go for listing on the stock exchange. The post issue shared up, paid up requirement is same for both the exchanges. It should not be more than 25 crore. The net worth should be positive for both the exchanges. However, BSC has put an additional requirement of net tangible assets of 1.5 crore as per the latest available audited financial results. When we talk about the uh, net tangible assets, 
it had to be calculated based on the reiterated financial statements of the company, not based on simply the audited financial statements. Then for the securities being eligible to be traded, uh, there is a requirement of 100% promoter holding in DMAT form. And the option of DMAT should be available with both the depositories, NSTL and CDSL. Then minimum there should be 50 allotted and the minimum application and trading lot size shall not be less than 1 lakh rupees. In both the cases, it should be 100% underwritten with 15% underwriting by the merchant bankers on their own books. For remaining 85%, there can be separate underwriters or the market maker can take the underwriting. Uh, then other listing conditions are for NSC, it should not have been referred to by FER. There should not be any winding up petition admitted by a court or of competent jurisdiction. Then there is no material regulatory or disciplinary action in the past three years against the company by any statutory regulatory authority or stock exchange. Now there are similar conditions for BSC also. Plus, BSC has also levied an additional condition that there shall not be any change in the promoters in the preceding one year. Uh, the company should have a functional website for both the exchanges. When it comes to migration, so what is migration? You get listed on an SME platform, but main board platform is a different platform. So how you go to the main board? For NSC, you have to be for on SME platform for minimum period of three years. Recently, it has been increased from two to three years. Then there should be a minimum shareholders numbering 1,000. There should be a minimum net worth of 50 crores, and the company should be positive EBITDA for three years continuously. These are the conditions where if you are complying with these conditions, you can migrate from NSC SME platform to the NSC main board. When it comes to BSC, it uh, requires that the minimum period of two years should have been completed, and then you can migrate to main board. There are certain more conditions in terms of shareholders approval which have to be complied with, which is separately uh, uh, covered in the different section. Now, how do you do the comparative analysis in terms of compliances? The compliance norm for main board says quarterly compliance. For SME, it is simplified half yearly compliance. For main board, you have to send the complete annual report to the stakeholders. For SME platform, it has to be a bridged annual report. For main board, you need to have a thousand shareholders at the time of IPO for SME it is 50. The issue expenses are quite high for main board. However, for SME platform, the expenses are minimal. Uh, for marketing, market making, there is no requirement under main board, but SME, there is a three year market making requirement. Even after three years, the company should continue with the market maker. Then listing rate fees is very high in case of main boards, which is again minimal around 25,000 for SME listed company. Underwriting in the terms of main board, it is soft underwriting. However, into SME platform, it is 100% hard underwriting. And for main board, SEBI gives the observations. However, for SME platform, the observations or the approval letters come from the stock exchanges. SEBI observations are not required. Now, how the issue process works and further details on the migration. So these are few pointers in which we will try to classify the entire issue process or take the journey of the entire issue. First is the appointment of intermediaries, which can be merchant bankers, the advisors and professionals, the RTA banker, lawyer, market maker, underwriter, and few other intermediaries. Then there is a requirement of a structuring. You have to identify the optimal capital structure that is your post issue, what should be the minimum capital? Then you have to dilute minimum 25%. So what would be the issue size? How it will be work? So those optimal capital structure have to be identified. Assessment of enterprise valuation and or what would be the offer size. Uh, simultaneously, there will be a process of due diligence, which is being conducted primarily by merchant banker. However, the due diligence process needs support of secretary, legal and finance function. The third party certification will also be required and the company structure will be verified. When we say company structure, it will not be just paid up capital, but uh, the governance structure also. Uh, then next comes the documentation. Uh, the legal due diligence report is obtained from the lawyer. The draft offer documentation compilation is completed and the in principle listing applications are filed. One P the file with the stock exchange, the regulatory approval comes after satisfaction of the queries of the stock exchange. It is not that once you have filed the application, the approvals are automatic. 
there may be multiple queries by the stock exchange or uh, there may be certain questions to bring out more clarity on the disclosures in the offer document, although need to be complied with. Along with this, you have to start working on the uh, marketing strategy, uh, whether you want to do undertake roadshow, press and broker meets, and you have to start meeting with the investors. Prior to issue opening, you have to file the prospectus with the ROC. This prospectus will be filed with GNL form and uh, under FGP route. Uh, then there would be finalization of issue price or the price bend if the company is planning for goodwill issue. There would be certain statutory advertisements which have to be issued. That is, prior to issue opening, there is one advertisement requirement. There is another advertisement requirement with respect to uh, your basis of issue advertisement. Uh, apart from that, there can be certain optional advertisements which can be issued during the offer period. There will be multiple agreements which are signed with the intermediaries, be it the merchant banker, market maker, underwriter, banker, or engagement letters with various other intermediaries. So all these agreements need vetting. So as part and parcel of the company team, you can assess the company vetting of these agreements too. Then comes the issue closure on which you have to do the allotment. The lock-in for the promoters should be in place and the listing application and approval should be obtained. Now, the major change which has come up over here, uh, SEBI has mandated that starting from September, uh, there is an option for getting company listed within three working days from the date of closure. And starting December, it will be three working days mandatory for all the IPOs which are coming. Earlier, this used to be six working days from the closure of the IPO. Uh, then post listing of the company, there are again certain compliances which have to be managed in terms of FISC filing, FCGPR filing, uh, there can be FCTRS filing also required if there is a certain offer for sale component involved. Then there is market making which has to be undertaken for three years. The compliances of market making needs to be verified because when you issue a secretary audit report to such uh, companies which are listed on SME, you need to ensure that market maker has also undertaken compliance because that is again a part and parcel or requirement under SEBI ICDR regulations. Then routing listing compliances have to be managed. Now, when you come up with an IPO, what kind of issues you can come up? One, it can be a fixed price issue. Second, it can be a book built issue. So under fixed price issue, uh, the issuer has to determine the price while registration of the prospectus with the ROC. The prospectus which is filed with ROC will contain the final issue price. At least 5% of the issue size shall be reserved for the market maker. Then minimum 50% of the offer has to be given to retail investors and balance has to be given for investors other than retail category. So in fake price issue, there are just two categories of investors. When it comes to the other side, which is the uh, book built issue. So the issuer uh, has to determine the price after registration of the RHP with the ROC. The final issue price will go while filing the prospectus with the ROC, which is after the issue closure. Then at least 5% of the issue size has to be reserved for the market maker uh, because this is a constant requirement for an SME issue. Under book build issue, not more than 50% of the offer size shall be reserved for QIB allocation, of which 5% has to be allocated for mutual funds. However, if mutual fund does not come, then it can go back to the original pool of 50%. Then not less than 35% of the offer size shall be reserved for retail investors and not less than 15% of the offer size should be reserved for institutional investors. So the material point which has to be seen is that we are talking about not more than, not less than, and not less than. Here we talk about minimum 50%. So these are the key numbers which have to be taken care of while undertaking the compliance. Uh, you should ensure that these numbers are adequately taken care of by finalization of the offer document. Now market making, the market maker has the obligation to provide two-way port in the market post listing of the equity shares and such show port will be available for at least 75% of the time during the day. Uh, the limits on the upper side for the market maker during market making process have been defined under SEBI circular. So if the issue size is up to 20 crore, the market maker inventory if it reaches 25% of the issue size, they will stop putting in court and 24% is their re-entry level. Similarly, different numbers have been specified for 25 to 50, 50 to 80, and above 80 crore issue sizes. Post issue compliances have to be undertaken. So there is a general applicability of LODR, PIT, and SAFG regulations. 
which may have certain event-based compliances uh, or certain routine compliances, then there are certain event-based compliances in terms of ICDR, buyback, and uh, uh, ESOP regulations. So under ICDR, for example, if you are doing a preferential allotment, so you have to go back to the ICDR and ensure that the compliances are being met with. So these are certain event-based compliances. Now migration to the main board. Under optional or compulsory migration, the process uh, more or less remains the same where you have to obtain shareholders approval by way of a special resolution. And the vote captured by the public shareholders should be at least two times the vote captured uh, in favor against uh, the vote captured. So two is to one ratio has to be maintained. The only difference between compulsory and optional is that in case of compulsory migration, the paid up capital will have to cross 25% of the 25 crore. However, in case of optional migration, the page, post of a face value of the capital should be more than 10 crore, but the capital can be less than 25 crore. So there the company has an option to migrate. Now, when this is a critical aspect related to the objects of the issue in terms of firm arrangement, which has to be made. So firm arrangement, means that you should be tied up with the sources of funds when you come out with the IPO. I have put it in two different examples. Example one on the left side and two on the right side. When we go to example one, for example, there are ABC, XYZ as the objects of the issue for which the requirement is 40 crore and the general corporate purpose is 10 crore. General corporate purpose in any case cannot exceed 25%. Now, if this entire, out of this requirement of entire 50 crores, the company has to come out with an IP of 45 crores and 5 crores will be used from internal accruals. So entire 50 crores is being sourced from internal accruals for the IPO. Now IPO 45 crores constitute 90% of the total issue size. So this 90% is very well above the limit of 75% of the fund requirement, which is one of the condition under SEBI ICDR regulations. Now we come to example two, where the issue objects remain same 40 and 10 crore, but the funding mode is different. So from the SME IPO, the company plan to raise 30 crore. From internal accruals, they plan to raise 5 crore. And there is a loan of 15 crores, which the company will avail. So the 15 crore of loan constitutes 30% of the total requirement of the funds. Now, the requirement which SEBI ICDR says is that there should be firm financial arrangement for 75% of fund requirement other than public issue. So public issue is 30 crores. Now out of the remaining 20 crores, you are raising 15 crores from debt. That means you should have a sanction letter, firm sanction letter from the banks for meeting this requirement of 15 crores. If you do not have the sanction letter of 15 crores, you cannot go ahead with the IPO. Then, ideally speaking, 100% of the object requirement should be tied up. It cannot happen that I say out of 50 crore, I know that I am raising 45 crore and 5 crore is something which I will raise in future. I will identify the sources of funds in future. That cannot happen. Now, process of application, bidding, and post issue compliance. These are certain practical aspects which are being covered now under this presentation. Some of the key points are that all the investors applying in an IP in a public issue can shall use only APA application supported by a blocked amount mechanism. There cannot be any other mode of putting an application. Whether you are going with uh, your online banking channel, you are going in with your three in one bank account, you are going in with UPI. Everywhere the funds will be blocked using APA mechanism. Then investors intending to subscribe shall submit a completely bid, completed bid term application form to SCSB, self-certified syndicate bank. So these ADBA banks are called as self-certified syndicate banks with whom the bank account to be blocked is maintained. Uh, after accepting application form, SCSB shall capture and upload details in the electronic bidding system and may begin blocking of funds. So this is when you submit your application with the bank. Else you can go to your broker, you can submit your application with the broker. What the broker will do after getting your application, they will get the amount blocked in your bank 
and then they will upload this application in the stock exchange terminal. So these applications are called as syndicate as by application, syndicate as by ASBA again. Now other intermediaries, after accepting the application form, respective intermediaries shall capture and upload details in the electronic bidding system. The stock exchange system will constantly interact with the depositories and will validate the bid details with the depository account records. So this is the practical side where a broker will punch in your details in the exchange system. The exchange system will parallelly check the same details with the depositories also to ensure that your PAN number, your deposit TPID and your client ID are matching uniform with the depository database. If there is an error, the application will be marked as a rejected application in the system or the correction has to be made by the broker for acceptance of that application. The network exchange will allow modification of select field DPID, client ID, or PAN ID, bank code, and location code in the bid already uploaded. So if there is an error which comes from the depository system to the exchange, the broker will come to know of that error and then the error will be rectified. Then investors can view the status of their applications on the stock exchange website and they will also receive a SMS for, from a stock exchange or an email in terms of uh, receipt of their applications. Now, what are the modes of applications under an IPO? So under an IPO, you can go ahead with a, either electronic application or you can also go with physical application. Under electronic applications, there are three modes available. One is online ad bar. You have a three-in-one account. That means, for example, HDFC or ICICI or Access. They provide you bank account also. They provide you DMAT account also. They provide you trading facility also. So all these three are combined together. This is called three-in-one account. You log in into your system. You make an application. Automatically, everything else happens. Second is bank ad bar through online channel. So that can be through internet banking, mobile banking, or syndicate UPI alpha. So you log into your, say for example, Exit Bank, you map your any of your DMAT accounts over there, you submit your application, and the blocking of funds will happen, and the bank will upload the application with the stock exchange terminal. And this will happen seamlessly through an automated process. You don't have to do anything. So again, this is an electronic application, but it moves through the bank alpha channel. Third is the syndicate alpha wherein you, for example, go to your any third party broker account. It can be any of your stock broker. You go to the website of the stock broker, you put the details. Now the stock broker will not be a bank necessarily unless or until it is an institution. So a stock broker, you have a linked bank account. So your linking will happen with that bank account. So this is well, the reason why it is called syndicate as well. That means a syndicate member has come in to bid your application. When we talk about physical applications, so physical applications are normal appli application by an investor in the bank alpha. So I can take a printout of the application from the stock exchange, fill it up and hand it over to my bank. The bank will do the blocking, the bank will do the bidding and my bid is accepted. Second is syndicate alpha, where I take a printout of the application form, fill it up and give it to my broker. My broker now carries the responsibility of taking it to the bank, blocking the funds, and then the broker will bid it with the stock exchange terminal. So this is again the same thing being picturized into a different manner. So as an investor, you can either directly go to ad or UPI, the fund blocking will happen. Otherwise, you can take your application form to the broker intermediary who will first have, let the blocking happen and then he will upload the bid on the stock exchange platform. Now, post closure of the issue, exchange will give this bid file. So when all the brokers or the banks upload the bill, there is a parallel buildup of a file at the stock exchange level that is called a bid file. For example, if 5,000 people have put in an application in an issue, on the day end when the issue closes, after 5 p.m., the exchange will give this application, this Excel file or the CSV file to the registrar to the offer. This file is called a bid file based on which the entire application allotment process runs. There are no physical applications which will be obtained by the RTI. Now, based on the bid file, the RTA will uh, now work toward finalization of basis of allotment to be submitted with the stock exchange. Once the basis of allotment is approved by the stock exchange, the issuer will pass a resolution for allotment. 
the issuer will parallelly start the process of corporate action, which is the demand credit of shares in the account of successful NOTs, and the instruction for fund transfer will be issue, uh, given. This fund transfer instruction is given in two modes. So as an applicant, I would have applied for 1,50,000 rupees under an IPO. But when an, or say I have applied for 5 lakh rupees under an IPO, now out of that 5 lakh, the allotment which will happen to me is only 1,25,000. So in my bank account, entire 5 lakh is blocked on the date of bidding the application. Now RTA will here give the instruction to the bank. Okay, allotment has been made for 1,25,000 rupees. So transfer this 1,25,000 to the account of the issuer, public issue account of the issuer. Remaining 3,75,000, you please unblock in the account of the investor only. So this is the unblocking and the release instruction which will be given by RTA. Then parallel application has to be filed for lifting and post uh, verification of the applica application and the record provided by the issuer, the stock exchange will give the lifting and trading approval. Now, this is the crunch timeline which are being effective from uh, mandatorily from December 2023 onwards, wherein the lifting had to complete in T plus three days. So there's a lot of pressure on the intermediaries and also the stock exchanges in terms of giving the approvals of processing the documents. There have been various cutoff times specified by SEBI. So each agenda item or each work has to be completed by that cutoff time only. So there is an electronic application for online as well, that these applications can be bidded only till 5 p.m. The electronic application for syndicate banking will be up to 4 p.m. and for syndicate non-retail and individual will be up to 3 p.m. When we come to physical application, bank as well will be up to 1 p.m. And others, acceptance of the application can be by 12 p.m. and it has to be submitted with the bank by 1 p.m. So these are the timelines which have to be adhered with. Then bid modification. So exchanges will allow bid modification from the date of opening of the issue up to 5 p.m. on the closing day when the bid period ends. Similarly, bid valid validation will also happen simultaneous on real-time basis with the depository sector. So that timeline is also similar, which is 5 p.m. on the closing day. Then UPI mandate acceptance. It will also have to be done up to 5 p.m. on the closing date. So if anyone is putting application through UPI, he has to ensure that he accept the mandate generated by NPCI by 5 p.m. Otherwise, the application will get rejected. Then reconciliation of UPI mandate. This has to be done by the banker to the issue and it will be done on daily basis. Then issue closure uh, for QIB and non-institutional investors. The issue will close at 4 p.m. For retail category, the issue will close at 5 p.m. And final certificates have to be issued by UPI Alpha Bank before 9.30 p.m. on the date of closure itself. For direct Alpha and syndicate Alpha, these final certificates have to be issued by banker to the issue before 7.30 p.m. This fund cert final certificate for funds will enable the registrar to assess that which application in the fund have been blocked and which applications are valid for the purpose of consideration of the allotment. Now comes the T plus one day, that means closing plus one day. On this day, the finalization of rejections and the basis of allotment has to be done by RTA up to 6 p.m. This application for basis of allotment approval will have to be filed with the stock exchanges. And the stock exchanges will have to give the approval before 9 p.m. on the same day. So again, if you see the regulatory timelines are such a stringent that even the exchanges will be working both uh, their normal working time, uh, just to ensure an idea that the three day timelines are being met with. So the entire pressure which will come over in these three day period is enormous and you need to do a lot of pre-planning for this. Then it comes to T plus two day, wherein SCSB will start crediting funds in the public issue account after RTA gives the instruction. They will also release the funds in the account of the investor if required to be done. The issuer will make the allotment the cutoffs which are available for T plus two days, the instruction for trans fund transfer to the banks has to be given before 9.30 a.m. The fund transfer has to be completed by bank before 2 p.m. There has to be a confirmation which has to be given by the bank that the fund transfer has happened. Then unblocking of funds have to be made before 4 p.m. 
before 2 pm the company has to file the corporate action for shares and the corporate action should get completed before 6 pm on the same date so this is also called as online corporate action where you get immediate credit of shares in the dmat account of the allottees and you get the final confirmation from depositories also for confirmation or completion of corporate action then filing of listing application has to happen before 7:30 pm and the basis of issue advertisement is also to be made available on the website of the issuer merchant bank and rta before 9 pm based on these the stock exchange will give the listing and trading approval on t plus 2 day on t plus 3 day the trading in the shares will commence and the newspaper advertisement or the basis of issue advertisement which was put on the website of the issuer and merchant banker that has to be published in the newspaper on t plus 3 day so this is how the trading will commence in t plus 3 working days from the date of closure of the issue now what are the documents required for an ipo so the structure and the compliance of the documentation is same 100% same to what is required under main board acted. One is draft red herring prospectus, second is red herring prospectus, and third is prospectus. DRHP is issued at before uh, for obtaining the in principle approval. Once the in principle approval is received and you are going ahead for opening of the issue, you have to file the RHP with ROC. Once the issue closes, the final issue price has to be incorporated in the offer document and then it becomes the prospectus and the prospectus is again to be filed with ROC. However, if we talk about, about fixed price issue, there are only two documents complete in all respects. Now, when we talk about uh, what all disclosures have to be made in the offer document, this is one indicative uh, 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 table given for the disclosures made in one of the offer documents. If you see, it contains certain general terms, then it contains the risk factors related to the issue, issuer, internal risk factors, and external risk factors. Then there is an introduction section wherein you have to give in three the offer details, the summary of restated financial information, uh, general information, and the capital structure. Then comes the disclosure related to particulars of the offer for the issue. Under offer for the issue, you have to mention the objects of the issue for which you are raising the funds, the basis for the offer price, how the offer price has been arrived at, the, the justification of the offer price, and a statement of special tax benefits available to the company. After that, there is a section which now completely talks about the information related to the company. So you have to talk about the industry overview, the business of the company, the business of the company will contain the complete details of business verticals, the numbers which have been achieved by each of the business vertical, the growth strategies of the company, the strength of the company, HR-related information, competition, insurance, properties, and all sort of information, IPRs related to the company. Everything is combined together in this particular section. Then key regulations and policies which are applicable to the company. Thereafter, history and certain corporate matters have to be given. This chapter contains information about the history, how the company was incorporated and evolved till date. The main objects are given in the memorandum, the subsidiaries, associates, and joint ventures of the company, and any shareholders' agreements which is there. It also needs to be disclosed under this chapter. Then our management gives details of the entire board of directors and the senior KM, uh, senior managerial persons who are appointed by the board along with their remuneration, the details, uh, the powers of each and every committee which has been formed by the company, the organization structure, and the ESOP related details. Then the disclosure is being made with respect to promoter and promoter group, the other group companies, and the dividend policy of the company. Thereafter come the details and the disclosures with respect to the financial information. So in an offer document, you have to give consolidated financial statements. The standalone financial statements and the financial statements of subsidiary can be posted on the website of the issuer company. Then there is a capitalization statement, three and four debt equity ratios, which will come. There is a separate chapter on the management discussion and analysis of financial condition and results of operation. So you have to give comparable numbers for three years. And also the reasons why the numbers have increased or decreased in each of the respective year, along with, with the justification or reason for the same. Uh, 
then indebted net will contain all the loans uh, which have been obtained by the company whether secured and unsecured for the purpose of business including short term and long term and they have the disclosure related to related party transactions then there are certain legal and other information which are outstanding litigation and material development government and other statutory approvals and regulatory disclosures then come the general section which are governing more with respect to the terms of the offer of a structure procedure and main provisions of the articles in the association now what are the intermediaries which are involved in the entire process the merchant maker legal advisor registrar to the issue market maker underwriter banker to the issue so your sponsor bank so banker to the issue and sponsor bank are different entities then marketing channel partners and sub brokers then there have to be depositors which have to be involved the statutory auditor scsb bank and advertising of pr agency as a pcs you can always get engaged with the companies not just uh, during the ipo process but for even for the period one year prior to the ipo where so you guide them from the entire road map you create the entire document structure you create the data room you ensure that the compliances are being done you ensure that the policies are created so all this in house strengthening and cleaning up both the works can be undertaken in the advisory capacity so that the company comes out clean and more strong when they are planning for an ipo so that the due diligence comes fairly clean so you need to have the right team and the skill set to make the ipo successful now documentation so documentation is being divided into five part broadly one is the secretarial records so on the secretarial records you have to maintain the all the registers the documents as required under the company act starting from resolutions register of member director uh, interested parties and everything then memorandum and articles of association you need to ensure that these are in line and in conformity with the requirements of stock exchanges for an ip listed company the capital structure of the company has to be identified the right capital structure and you have to achieve that targeted capital structure the industry regulation which are applicable and whether the company is in compliance with such regulations or not entry in certain corporate matter management of the company the promoter and promoter group and group companies now what happens if some of the documents are not available as a merchant banker we always give a risk factor stating that these documents are not available and these disclosures have been made on so and so basis this becomes a point of concern for any regulator while processing the document so you have to ensure that every document every backup is available in the records of the company so that such kind of anomalies are removed from the documentation process uh, then comes the financial related uh, information which is primarily the restated financial statements which have to be created the management discussion and analysis have to be formed and the reasons have to be identified for the growth or the decrement of the numbers the uh, then financial indebtedness whether all charges have been filed whether the charges have been filed in time uh, if these are unsecured loan whether the proper documents are in place when we talk about charges we, it is not just the sanction letter but there should be a deed of hypothecation there can be a loan agreement there can be mortgage creation documents everything need to be in place the repayment schedule also need to be in place then what are the statement of possible tax benefits which will be arrived to the investors or the company they have the business related information so again while undertaking compliance for business related information you can help the issuer to create the order book or to compile the order book you can help issuer to consolidate the record related to the employees and the insurance proper insurance which have been obtained or the property document uh, whether it is leased or owned property by the company then there is a separate uh, information disclosure for the objects of the issue and the objects of the issue there are various requirements like uh, the supporting documents in terms of uh, work orders or the quotation signed place or not whether the list of litigation in which the company the uh, company directors and the company promoters are involved then risk factors need to be identified and to the extent possible mitigation of these risk factors before the merchant bankers are appointed 
then government and the statutory approvals, whether all these approvals are in place or not. They have the agreement with the intermediaries. So market maker, underwriter, banker to the issue, merchant banker, registrar, all these entities enter into agreement with the issuer company. You can, as a legal counsel or as a advisor, as a practicing professional assisting the company, you can get into verification and validation of all these agreements from the point of view of issuer company. Then certification may be obtained, which are non-mandatory in nature. Uh, so there can be certification that's required to build up of the capital structure, the management structure, or the compliance with the corporate governance. So these are few indicative uh, avenues where you can get associated with the company and help the company to reach to a stage where they are ready to come out with an IPO. With this, I'll take a rest and I'll thank the entire audience for patiently listening to me. Uh, my contact details are also available on this page and uh, I'll request the Institute to share this presentation also with the participants so that if you, any of you have any queries, you can also directly send it to me. Uh, I think we can, uh, Rajesh, if uh, you can put yes. on the floor for question and answers. Yes, yes. Uh, we have already received, uh, is it audible from my side? Yes. Okay. So I, I am taking uh, one by one question answer, which are received from a chat box. Uh, I think uh, all the delegates have interestingly taken uh, participation and taken keen interest in your uh, session. Even I was also listening carefully. Uh, it is evident from the question also, total uh, 20 to 25 questions are there. And I will uh, filter and summarize uh, in a one by one. Sure. Uh, first question. Uh, first question is: uh, What would be the compliance if foreign company wants to invest in SME listed company in India? So, so foreign company, invest. Huh. Yeah. So foreign company they need to come through custodian or either through a FPI route. They need to get themselves registered, and once they have custodian in place, they can invest into the IPO through those custodians. Okay, sir, out of this uh, one question from my side. So, but one more thing, one more thing. When the foreign companies or foreign investors comes into investing into Indian companies, we need to see two limits. One, an individual cannot own more than 10% and total foreign shareholding as per the RBI norm cannot exceed 24% unless until you increase this limit by modification of your articles of association. So based on your size of the issue and the existing foreign holding which is there in the company, you can go ahead and modify your articles and open it for the investors. Okay. One uh, one question from uh, this question only that is from my side. Sir, what about the track record of a foreign company which want to get listed on the SME? The foreign company cannot get listed on the SME platform. But, so they uh, have but to be after Indian incorporating... Uh, they have company. to be an Indian arm, which is a subsidiary of the foreign company. So they can create a company in India. They can carry on the business operations in that uh, wholly owned or the, or the subsidiary. And this subsidiary has to meet the same eligibility norms which are there for any other Indian company. So you mean to say that uh, the, the new, new vehicle should have a track record, not a parent company? No, parent track record will also be eligible. But uh, the company which is coming out with an IPO has to be an incorporated entity in India. Okay, so fresh incorporation company can get listed since it has a track record of parent company which yes. is in abroad. Yes, parental track record is required. Okay, good. Second question, what are the options available to SME listed companies if it wants to raise more fund after initial listing? The, after initial listing, the options available are either in form of a follow-on public offer which is not much advisable in all the cases. Uh, you can go ahead with the rights issue or you can go ahead with preferential allotments or QIP, which is Qualified Institutional Placement. Preferential allotment, in this kind of allotment, any investor can come, be it an institution or an individual or a corporate or HNI, ultra HNI. However, when we talk about Qualified Institutional Placement, only QIBs will be eligible to come as an investor in that. Okay. So, more prominent route which are being followed by the company is the preferential allotments. Good. What would be the scenario if SME 
after crossing the specified limit wants to transit from SME exchange to main board exchange. It is, I think, migration. Yes, migration is possible. So only after two years, is there any time limit for having a standing listing record or as a SME? No, no. Uh, and in fact, uh, on NSC also earlier it was two years, but recently they have modified it to three years. So NSC will not permit migration before three years. And even when you are migrating, say for example, when you come out with an SME issue, your paid up capital post issue is 5 crore. But when you want to migrate to main board, you have to first increase your capital to minimum 10 crore, and then you have to go for migration. So 10 crore is the minimum capital requirement for migration. So for migrating a company from SME to main board, so company initially listed, let's say in NSE, so it has to follow the criteria of NSE only. If it is going on NSC main board, it has to follow NSC. So can However, a NSC listed company can go on BSE main board? Yeah, that has been provided for. So they can go, but uh, then they have to follow the criteria for migration for the exchange on which they are going. Okay, okay. So we can go for BSC NS uh, listing for main board, but we have to follow the criteria of uh, existing uh, requirement of exchange. Of the main board exchange. Okay. How does SME listing impacts ownership and control of the company? I uh, think it is a very specific no question. Much, yeah, there is no uh, much difference in a main board or SME listed company. There is always a dilution in control. Uh, so the promoters have to live with it. The best example which I say, you can own 100% of a 100 crore company or you can own 50% of a 1000 crore company. It's the promoter who have to decide what they want to own. Correct, correct. And uh, what are the special tax benefit to SME listed company? Uh, so there are no special tax benefit to SME listed company. The only benefit which I can foresee is that the section 56.27b of the Income Tax Act that is not applicable in terms of justification of the premium amount which is uh, raised on allotment, fresh allotment. Uh, to the shareholder, there are benefits in terms of uh, concessional rate of uh, capital gain tax. If it is a long-term capital gain uh, and FTT is paid on the sales, the shareholder will be liable to pay only 10% at the tax rate. And if it is a short-term capital gain, the shareholder will be paying 15% at the tax rate. So, you mean to say that there is no tax benefit for the company as such, right? No. It is. It will be a par. Yes. Uh, for deciding criteria of MSME regarding turnover, whether export turnover will be considered or it can be only domestic? As I said, MSME definition has a requirement of turnover. But when we talk about a SME listing or SME IPO, we have to follow just the norms of the stock exchange. And stock exchange have not provided any turnover norms. Secondly, turnover will always include export turnover also because we are talking about the total top line of the company. As regard to the deciding investment in the plant and machinery, which block should be considered, net or gross? It will be gross block. Gross block, yes, because the word used is investment in the yes. block. Yes. So investment always with original cost. Original value. Uh, does uh, non-allowing dual listing impact the listing goal of SMEs? Uh, so for this, we need to understand why the concept of SME was brought in and what was the objective. The SME concept was brought in to provide the liquidity, much required liquidity to a smaller businesses also, uh, which was earlier not available. But when we talk about small companies, there are limited disclosures and the limited performance history available. So every investor cannot come and take a call, conscious call on the investment perspective. That was the reason why the structure was designed in such a manner by regulator that listing is permitted only on one exchange so that the investor can, the informed investor, they can make a better investment decision or they can take an investment decision which is best in their interest after analyzing the provisions. Secondly, on SME, there is a requirement of market making. Since the company is small, more depth is not available in terms of volumes of the shares. So listing on both the exchanges with a very small volume of trading is not feasible or logical. So that is the reason why the listing of SMEs have been restricted only to one exchange. Okay. Uh, why we need to have appoint both custodians in SDL and CDSL? Uh, 
So it has to be two way fungibility. So as an investor, if I'm applying in an IPO with NSGL as a DMAT account, and tomorrow I'm selling and the buyer is having a CDSL DMAT account, the shares will not go in CDSL. So that's the reason. Uh, yes, it is It is for greater transferability. Yes. More liquidity. Yes. Uh, for how many financial years do the financial need to be restated? And do all the amounts need to be restated? Yes, the restatement has to be done for all the amounts or all the heads of, of uh, or the accounting entries which are coming in the books of accounts. And this restatement has to be done for three years plus the job period. For example, now we are coming to the month of October. So regulation says that the death load financial cannot be older than six months. So the company has to give last three preceding financial year plus a three month or four month of audited number for the current financial year. So three years is mandatory. In case of offer for sale, sir, whether uh, FC TRS filing is required? Yes, if there is a seller who is a, a foreign national or a non-resident, FC TRS will be required. What is the tentative cost involved in SME IPO? <laughs> it changes from issuer to issuer. I think this uh, this person might be from Gujarat or Maharashtra. <laughs> the person who is asking the question. <laughs> uh, maybe, but yes, uh, the cost will change from uh, company to company, the business, the industry in which they are operating, and even the merchandisers who are being appointed. So everything changes the cost structure. And even the fund, uh, the size of the issue also changes the cost structure. For example, if uh, there is a fixed piece of 5 lakh rupees for any expenditure held, if you are doing a uh, issue of 10 crore, 5 lakh will have a different percent and 50 crore issue will have a different percent. Yes, correct, correct. Because And listing fee will remain always same. Yes. Absolutely. What, what are the size, no problem. Yes. Uh, is there any case study of uh, voluntary delisting from SME? Not as of now. Yet, yet as of now, not seen. Okay. No. Uh, it is good to issue ESOP before SME listing or would it be wait for a uh, post issue? The ESOPs are always good to be issued at any point in time. The company should not wait for listing because ESOPs has a different objective. ESOP are look forward for retaining the quality employees with the organization and listing is only an exit route which is being provided. So ESOP should always be part and parcel of the organization structure even prior to IPO. Okay. Uh, what happens if company stop the meeting the prescribed limit as an SME? Uh, in terms of, uh, and that the question is uh, silent about these uh, sub questions. Sir, your voice is not. Uh, I think network issue is there. Uh, is it audible from my side, technical team, please? So I think the Nitin sir is uh, having trouble. Uh, he has lost the connection. So we have to wait for uh, some time. Yes, he is uh, now live. Sir, your voice is mute. Uh, uh, your uh, I'm yes. sorry. I believe there was some power outage which shut down the internet. No problem. So we were on the last question. Uh, that is, uh, if what if uh, the company stopped the meeting the criteria of SME? So as I said, say for example, the number of shareholders falls below 50. 
it does not yes. matter as long as it is uh, with respect to the paid up capital of the company it cannot fall below uh, the required threshold because it will require reduction of capital uh, and there are no other parameters which uh, will govern because the company which is profitable today may turn into losses tomorrow so profitability in all these criteria do not matter post listing so they will continue to be listed on the exchange platform okay sir uh, i think uh, all question has been answered as of now and uh, from last question from my side sir what do you yes. see the future of sme platform in india and uh, how you suggest to the we can suggest to the regulator for uh, giving more attractive uh, platform to the entrepreneurs uh, so the vision of the regulators in fact is to enhance the platform availability and bring in more and more participants to create more depth into this particular segment with the segment so they want to increase the pool of smes from 500 which is available as of now to a much larger number which can be 5x or 10x also uh, the regulators are very inclined towards working for this and uh, the regulators are themselves also conducting various programs and sessions in terms of promoting and making promoters familiar with the exchange requirement and the listing norms because the first and foremost requirement is education of the promoters now as a professionals i believe we have to carry this baton with us to educate the promoter that how this sme is listing is going to help them or is going to benefit them in long term my personal view is that every company is not good for listing we have to identify that what is the best possible company which can come out for listing because at the end of day the listed company has to sustain a growth for future they have to create a value for future so we have to identify such potential companies which can go ahead and create value for the shareholders in long term uh, the regulators have already provided the much required platform they have already provided uh, various relaxed norms now these norms at certain places may need simplification or certain places may need more tightening of the regulatory compliance and norms these will be depending based on the, how the markets are evolving uh for example we understand that uh, exchanges are now looking for uh, they have always taken care that the good companies are coming on the platform but now they are aggressively working on identifying such kind of good companies across the country they are uh, basically uh, not incentivizing but they are educating companies that how you can build up the platform or you can use the platform to raise capital for future uh if we see in last two years uh the turnaround has been immense the turnaround why it has been immense because people things have gone to online channel in the last two years the visibility have increased earlier there would have have been newspaper advertisement for various ipos which were coming now with social media and various other websites and modes available the investors are well aware of the kind of companies which are coming up for an issue uh, for ipo the investor the number of investors have also increased multifold in the last two year three year thanks to the covid which acted as an opportunity for this industry uh, so this has increased the participation in the industry uh, one of the mutual fund they have come up with their own uh, mutual fund scheme for targeting such very small scale companies so these are evolving markets and once we have these kind of more institutional investors be it mutual fund be it the foreign investors or be it other domestic institutions if they start to come in the market then obviously it will create a more larger depth in the market and uh, i think we can see even increase in the size of sme ipos last i believe the sme ipos would have come up to 100 crores but uh, going forward if the trend continues we can see a sme ipo of 150 crores also very soon so that the kind of uh, opportunity the platform is providing okay sir and uh, last question is there any subsidy available for uh, from various governments like the state or central government for meeting the expenses so there are some subsidy not from every state government so there are two kind of things available one in southern india there are one or two states which provide subsidy on the cost which has been incurred on the sme issue second various state governments have also created their own venture funds or their own state sponsored funds which on finding the right company they will also invest into such sme ipos 
Maharashtra has one such fund, Rajasthan has one such fund. So these funds are also predominantly active in the SME space. Okay. And yes, I, I am aware that Gujarat government is also giving subsidy on uh, expenditure incurred for yes. the SME. Yes. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, I think we conclude. Let me check chat box again if there is any more question because time is also there. Yes, uh, now no more question is regard to any things. Sir, I am happy that you have said ex exhaustively and exclusively on the SME listing and very since beginning how to take care as a professional until the end of the listing day and the, what is the as a professional should take care at the listing during process of the, the listing and after uh, listing what are the compliance to be taken care of yes as a professional it was a very uh, insightful and gainful uh, session which you delivered and you have touched more, much more practical aspects also as regard to the bidding process because i have came with a practical experience that some brokers are not allowing to deal with the sme scripts so that has to be taken care as a promoter because our our prospective investor has demat account over there so they cannot even though having fund they cannot apply over there and you have rightly pointed out that things and uh, timings by which time you can apply or you cannot apply on the last day of the list uh, uh, closer day of the issue these were also very in, uh, informative slide and uh, i am thankful to you and council for giving this opportunity to me to host this webinar and i on behalf of icsi also thank uh, thank you to nitin sir and all the delegates for giving huge response to this kind of the learning series and we hope for very uh, very uh, you know, uh, gainful relationship with icsi as a speaker again we will call you sir and i am happy that, that you will be ready for us and as and when we call and i am thankful to council and president for giving this opportunity thank you sir thank you have a nice day and i am again thankful to team of the icsi who is taking support and giving support to this webinar thank you all and all thank you thank you sir thank you and it's always a pleasure to be in front of the members and sharing my thoughts with them thanks a lot thank you thank you, thank you.